grocery store workers and truck drivers and so many others on the front lines of this crisis, putting their own lives in danger for the rest of us. If we didn't know it before, we know it now. They are the backbone of this nation. Our immediate priority is to get through this public health crisis and get help into the pockets of American workers. American workers. More than 20,000 Americans have died already. Our federal government needs to learn from this catastrophic mistakes it's made over the past few months and take action to turn the tide on this virus. And in doing so, it needs to focus on the racial disparities in cases and deaths that we've been talking about to protect African-Americans and Latino families who've borne so much of the brunt of this ep epidemic. So let's be clear, the coronavirus isn't Donald Trump's fault, but the fact that Americans has, America has more cases than any country in the world is his responsibility. New reporting over the weekend showed that he turned a blind eye to China's mistakes at a critical moment. He tried to downplay the danger to, to keep the stock market high. He rejected the advice he was getting from his own experts to prepare, to prepare for what was coming. They told him, now we're all playing, paying a very high price for his bad judgment, bad decisions, bad instincts of this administration. You know, we all know more than 16 million Americans have lost their jobs already. Our federal government has to act more decisively to get assistance the Congress has already approved of more than $2.2 trillion into the hands of those who need it the most workers, families, small businesses. And this leads me to a critical point. When this crisis has receded, we can't just talk about, think about building back to the way things were before. We need to build better for the future. Many of the biggest cracks in our social safety net have been laid bare by this crisis. From health care to paid sick leave to the shortcomings of our unemployment system. And we need to build build a 21st century safety net that takes care of all of our citizens in times of crisis. And I mean all of our citizens. Yes, in all times, not just in crisis. You know, we're going to need to address rebuilding our nation's infrastructure. We're going to need to shore up our democracy. We need, we all have to know the clock is ticking. We don't have a moment to waste in combating the climate crisis. It's existential threat to us. In short, we need to build a fair, more inclusive, more resilient America. And with that in mind, I'd like to welcome to this conversation a leader who shares those values and has been an outspoken advocate for that vision for a long time. My friend, Senator Bernie Sanders. Bernie, welcome. Joe, thank you very much for your remarks and thank you for welcoming me, me uh, to your live stream here. Um, as you've indicated, we are living in an unbelievably unprecedented moment. You and I were chatting a few months ago, not in a million years, would we have believed that we would be talking to each other in our respective homes, that we could not you know, do rallies, that we could not uh, get out of the house. Uh, we would not have believed uh, that we'd be looking not only at a pandemic, which as you indicated has taken over 20,000 lives in our country, half a million people infected, uh, but has cost us 16 million jobs. And that's probably a conservative number. The real number is probably higher than that. So we are in a terrible moment, an unprecedented moment. And I know we share the, the understanding that we've got to go forward right now and out of this in an unprecedented way uh, to address the terrible pain that so many of our fellow Americans are feeling. So today I am asking all Americans, I'm asking every Democrat, I'm asking every independent, I'm asking a lot of Republicans to come together in this campaign to support your candidacy, oh. which I endorse, to make certain that we defeat somebody who I believe, and I'm speaking just for myself now, uh, is the most dangerous president in the modern history of this country, a president, and you made this point, who downplayed this pandemic, who ignored the advice that some of his people were giving him, uh, which has not, who has not used the Defense Production Act early on so that we could produce the masks, the gowns, the gloves, the ventilators, 
that our medical personnel desperately need, who today, because I understand that is threatening to fire Dr. Fauci, who has been an unbelievable, I mean, it is, who has been day after day, the voice of science uh, to the American people trying to explain how we go forward uh, in this crisis. And he's threatening to fire him. So to me, for all of those reasons, and, and so many more, a president who doesn't, apparently has never read the Constitution of the United States, who believes he's above the law, a president who lies all of the time, a president who has at least shown me that he is a racist and a sexist and a homophobe and a xenophobe and a religious bigot. I mean, for all of those reasons or more, we've got to make Trump a one-term president, uh, and we need you in, in the White House. Now, I will do uh, all that I can uh, to see that that happens, Joe. And, and I know that there is an enormous responsibility on your shoulders right now. Uh, and uh, it's imperative that all of us work together uh, to do what has to be done, not only in this moment, but beyond this moment in the future of this country. And in that regard, I have been very pleased that your staff and my staff have been working together over the last several weeks uh, to coming up with a number of task forces. Uh, these are uh, task forces that will look at some of the most important issues facing this country. Uh, the economy, how we create an economy that works for all, not just a few. Uh, education, how we create the best educational system in the world for all of our people. Uh, how we deal with climate change, uh, which as you indicated is an existential threat to the planet. Uh, how we deal with uh, criminal justice, because uh, we don't want to continue having more people in jail than any other country on earth. How we deal with immigration uh, reform. Uh, and uh, you know how we have a healthcare system that is so much better than what we have right now. Now, it's no great secret out there, Joe, that you and I have our differences, and we're not going to pay for them over. That's real. Uh, but I hope that these task forces uh, will come together, uh, utilizing the best minds and, and people in your campaign and in my campaign uh, to work out real solutions to these very, very uh, important uh, problems. So. Uh, look forward to working with you and uh, bringing some great people into those task forces. Well, uh, Bernie, I want to thank you uh, um, uh, for that. It's, it's, a, it's a big deal. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I think that uh, your endorsement means a great deal. It means a great deal to me. I think people are going to be surprised that we are apart on some issues, but we're awfully close on a whole bunch of others. And, uh, and I think you've made, I'm, if, if I am the nominee, which it looks like now <laughs> you just made me, um, I, uh, I'm going to need you, not just to win the campaign, but to govern. And so uh, uh, do, you, do you have any questions for me, Bernie, at all? I did, Joe. Um, you know, just um, uh, let's talk about some of the areas that I think we are actually fairly close. There are some areas where we disagree, but somewhere we are fairly close. Let's talk about the economy. Uh, and above and beyond the crisis that we're in right now, uh, you know uh, very well that millions of our people are working for starvation wages. And one of the fights that I've been waging for a number of years now is to raise that minimum wage uh, to at least 15 bucks an hour. Is that something, Joe? Uh, that you are supportive of. Bernie, I am extremely supportive of that. And I thank you for leading on it. I thank you for your endorsement, your support. But it means, look, it means a great deal to me personally. As I said in my statement, when you suspended your campaign, I want to thank you for being the powerful voice. And you've been the most powerful voice for a fair and more just America. It's a voice like yours that refuses to allow us just to accept what is. You've refused to accept that we can't change what's wrong in our nation. You refuse to accept that health and well-being of our fellow citizens and our planet isn't the responsibility of somebody else. It's our responsibility to act night. And you don't get enough credit, Bernie, for being the voice that forces us to take a hard look in the mirror and ask ourselves, have we done enough? And we haven't. 
One issue you've led in the past is making sure that every single solitary thing we can do to keep workers whole during this crisis is a part of it. It goes well beyond the $15 an hour. As I said, more than 16 million, and you're right, it's probably significantly more than 16 million Americans have lost their jobs because that's a lagging indicator. And Congress has appropriated more than $2.2 trillion in this last round of so-called CARES Act. And my concern is the Trump administration is going to continue to do what it's always done. And that is it's going to make sure the response in a way that the structural benefits go to the wealthy and the well-connected. And that's been your cry for a long time, Bernie. Basically, they're helping their friends. It isn't about the legislation. The legislation has been good. It's about how it's being implemented. The biggest, best connected firms are getting assistance as fast as they can ask for it. Oversight and few conditions from Treasury and the Fed have been sort of wiped away. We should be imposing much stricter conditions on these big firms, telling them they only get the relief if they keep workers on their payroll, keep their jobs, make a commitment they won't buy back their stock, pay out dividends, enrich their executives. In fact, Donald Trump and his team are trying to gut the whole oversight of the corporate loan program. Now, Trump right. fired the inspector general, I know you know this, who was put in place to police corporate corruption. And what's he trying to hide? Congress should demand answers, and I know you will. Meanwhile, the little guy, the mom and pop shops, the men and women and minority-owned businesses, they have the fewest resources to fall back on in this crisis. And they're facing obstacles and delays that threaten their very existence of their businesses. And But no one in Donald Trump's White House or Treasury is taking the kind of bold action required to make sure that those without prior wealth, without prior wealth or prior connections, get a priority. We should insist that the Trump White House and the Treasury Department move more aggressively to get those grants and loans to small businesses now when they really need it. And if the banks won't do it, to go back to your point, the processing, they won't process the loans for small business regardless of their size, then the federal government should use their wartime authority to compel them to do so. Because otherwise, in six months, we're going to look back and see that this crisis has only made inequity worse in America. And I've said it from the beginning of our conversation, we just can't think about building back to the way things were before. That is not good enough. We need to build for a better future, and that's exactly what these task forces, your team and mine, have put together to focus on. I'll have a lot more to say about that, as you will too, but first, I want to thank you for your question. And Bernie, if I don't mind, Bernie, how, how do we, over the long haul, if I may ask, make sure we strengthen the economy to work for all people? And beyond the $15 minimum wage, how, what else should we be doing, Bernie? Well, Joe, thanks for your answer to the previous question, because you're absolutely right. And I want everybody to hear and understand what Joe has just said. Uh, among many other provisions, we put in there, wasn't my first priority by any means, $450 billion for large corporations. It's a lot of money. And what Trump now wants to do is to spend that money without telling us who gets it. Exactly. Can you believe that? I mean, it is, it is beyond comprehension. And that issue of transparency, if you receive money from the federal government, I'm sorry, we are gonna know who you are, we're gonna know the nature of the contract that was established Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. But we need, as you indicated, absolute uh, transparency. Uh, the other thing, Joe, I think we have to deal with right now is with so many folks uh, unemployed and underemployed. Uh, we've got to make sure that the government comes up with a continued set of policies that protect those workers. Um, and the pain all over the country. Uh, is now horrific. You have seen, as I have, these lines of cause of people in the United States of America, of folks who have just lost their jobs, who have no food in the pantry, they are now lining up to get food. So we've got to do everything that we can as rapidly as we can to make sure that nobody in America goes hungry, that nobody in America during this crisis, in my view, lacks uh, health care, and nobody in America in this crisis is evicted from their homes, loses, lose, evicted from their apartments, loses their homes. There's an enormous amount of work that has to be done to protect workers uh, in this country, in this crisis right now. 
But the question you ask, as I understand it, is where do we go from here? I mean, hopefully sooner than later, God willing, uh, this crisis ends. And how do we create a more just and fair society? I think that was your question, yeah? Yeah. All right. So I, and I, I think you and I understand the problems. We may disagree a little bit on the issues. But first of all, it seems to me to be obvious uh, that people should not be working Other in way. the richest country in the history of the world uh, at starvation wages. Well, you I know, tell you, you. Go ahead, Joe. You know, Bernie, you and I have always shared a profound conviction as long as we've both been in politics. This country wasn't built by Wall Street. It wasn't built by CEOs and hedge fund managers. It was built by workers. The great American middle class was built by American labor unions, unions. And yes, unions, that's the story of America. Ordinary people from the neighborhoods you and I grew up in doing extraordinary things given half a chance. Millions of people all across this nation who get up every day and go to work, raise their families, pay their taxes, volunteer in their communities, and make this country work. We're watching them. They're the people making it work now. Right. And people understand that being middle class isn't a number. It's a value set. It's about being able to own your own home and not have to rent it if that's what you choose. It's being able to live in a neighborhood where you can send your kids to a park and they're going to come home safely. Or, or being able to send your kids to a good high school or a good school, public school, when they'll do well enough that they can go on to trade school or college or community college, whatever they suits them well. And it's about being able to take care Take care of your, your your geriatric mom when your dad passes or about being able to put money aside so your kids won't have to take care of you when you're, you know, when, when we're, you have been able to save for retirement. And, and at, at the turn of the 20th century, our labor movement built the middle class out of factory workers. And now, two decades later, the 21st century, our labor movement is trying to build that by including not just factory workers, but service workers too. Healthcare and home care workers, you've been fighting for them for a long time. Child care workers, janitors, garbage uh, truck drivers, grocery store clerks, fast food workers. In short, people on the front lines of this crisis. Here's what I'm hoping, Bernie. I'm hoping that the American people are gonna get a fresh look at really who makes the country run. I really mean it. Good. We're mm -hmm. seeing the country restore its the soul of America. We're seeing a little bit of it. These people coming forward doing extraordinary things when they don't have to. And I want Donald Trump to look at these people in the eye and tell them after they put their lives in the line for the rest of us that they don't deserve a living wage, that they don't deserve health care, that they don't deserve to be able to send their kids to college or community college or trade school, that they don't deserve to make equal pay for equal work. I, I, I want them to look them in the eye and tell them that they don't deserve to be able to organize to fight for what they deserve, to bargain with dignity, to demand their employers give them their due. I want them to look them in the eye and tell them that, they're, that the scientists are wrong, that climate change is not an existential crisis demanding worldwide domestic and international responses. You know, I want them to tell the moms and dads across the country that their children and grandchildren don't have the right to clean air and water. Look, the United States has no choice but to seize this opportunity and create millions, millions of great paying jobs that your energy plan has suggested and mine as well. An energy infrastructure of tomorrow, not going back to anything that was before, tomorrow. And we take a backseat to no one when it comes to fighting climate change or when it comes to creating good paying jobs, middle class jobs, union jobs. You know I led the Recovery Act, which was the single greatest investment in clean energy in American history. We could do more, we should do more. As president, I'll put pipe fitters, iron workers, steel workers, electricians, and other trades to building the infrastructure over the clean energy future. American workers should build American infrastructure and manufacture all the materials that go into it. And all the workers must have an option to join a union. You know, when they came up with the Fair Labor Standards Act, they didn't say it's okay to have a union. It said we should encourage, encourage the formations of unions. When unions are doing well, everybody's doing well. And Bernie, you and I have spent our careers fighting for these folks, and I, want, I look forward to working with you, and I'm going to need you badly because it leads me to another important issue, in my view. Bernie, you've been maybe the most powerful voice for every generation of Americans, but I want to talk to you a moment about the people who are going to get hit the hardest by this crisis. And you and I both know it's not folks our age and young, just younger. It's Generation Z. 
people in their teens and their 20s. These are the people who are going to begin their careers, people working their way through college or trade school. They're going to have student loans. They're going to come into the economy and economy in turmoil. We're going to be worse than we are. The predictions are it's going to be like Roosevelt, what he faced and worse. We saw it with the millennials after the 2008 crash. They're still struggling to catch up. So what politics and what policies do we need to address for the concerns of these young people? Because I do think they've been put behind the eight ball more than our generation was or any generation in recent history. Well, that's absolutely true, Joe, and I'm glad you are prepared to focus on that issue. It's the right thing to do, and that is a generation of young people who are experiencing crisis after crisis. So let me start off by saying uh, that in my view, uh, if we believe in a strong democracy, which you do and I do, we have actually read the Constitution of the <laughs> United States, unlike the current president. Uh, if we understand that in a competitive global economy, we're going to need the best educated workforce in the world. I think you understand and I understand that free public education has got to go beyond 12th grade right now that we need to make public colleges and universities tuition free, and that we have to move very aggressively to dealing with the reality that so many of our people, young and not so young, are struggling okay. with this outrageous level of student debt. All right, I have outlined a program, Joe. Why don't you tell us you know, how you think we can best address this issue of making uh, college uh, open to all people regardless of income dealing with student debt? Well, look, I, uh, Bernie, uh, um, my uh, deceased son is still paying off his loan. We're now paying it off. Now, he went to a private university, um, but still paying off his loan. Um, my daughter is still paying off her loans. Uh, and look, we need to think about what we can do to address these concerns. Look, you've been a leader on the student debt issue and affordability of higher education. I've been saying for a long time, you probably heard me say it in the past, you know, one of the reasons why we jumped ahead and stay, one of the reasons why we jumped ahead of the rest of the world back at the turn of the 20th century, we were the first nation in the world to come along and say, we have universal education for 12 years. If it hadn't been done and we were just doing it for the first time in 2020, would anybody think 12 years is enough to be able to compete in the 21st century? I think not. But one of the things that I've changed my mind on, I propose to forgive debt for low-income and middle-class individuals, for community colleges and the like. But here's the deal. If you're attending a public university, college university, as well as a private HBCU, a historic black college or minority serving institutions, I've already called for immediate canceling of a minimum of $10,000 of their student loan debt now under this crisis and allow them to borrow so they can cope with this crisis. Look, I propose then, you know, aggressively canceling student debt for those who, uh, who were abused and misled by private for-profit colleges. So have you. You've been way ahead. And those are folks with some of the highest debt burdens. As I've said earlier, as, as we deal with the immediate crisis response, we can't lose sight of the longer term. When we come out of this, we can't just go back to business as usual. We need to build a better, stronger foundation for America. In 2021, our whole country will have to take a hard look and ask, how do we fix what's deeply broken? Here's my pledge. We'll, I will make an educator, an education that in fact, Jill, my wife is a, uh, a, a, a professor at a community college says any country that outcompetes us, Joe, is going uh, out educates is going to outcompete us, and so we'll make education our community college free for all. And here's the thing that has changed with this crisis: at our public colleges and universities, make them free for all lower income and middle class families and middle class families. Because, look, they're going to face an enormous burden. Where are they going to get the money to go even though our state universities are borrowing that money? We have to lower the cost of private, historic black colleges and universities and minority-serving institutions as well and ease the burden of student debt. And we'll address the existential climate change as well. Look, in terms of student debt, anybody who is making under less than $125,000 
who in fact has a debt having gone to a community college in their family, I mean, excuse me, gone to a, a, a state university, they should be able to get debt forgiveness as well and instead of, in addition to just being able to go free to a community college because they've been so badly banged since 2008. We got to build a green, resilient, sustainable infrastructure that will power generations of inclusive growth while saving our planet. Look, and we're going to confront income and equity in this nation, build a social safety net that gives all Americans the dignity and security they deserve. And we're going to we're going to make sure health care. And this is your signature issue is made affordable and accessible to every American and build a public health system that can prevent future pandemics. I want to talk to you about this. I really think we should be thinking about having a new office, a new cabinet office on pandemics in the United States. But that's another issue. But we're going to finally achieve comprehensive immigration reform as well, put millions of citizens on a pathway to citizenship, including so many who are on the front lines right now. The, 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 the number of, of undocumented who are out there now risking their lives, risking their lives. You know, one of the things I had the greatest pleasure in doing when I was vice president is going to one of Saddam Hussein's on my multiple visits to Iraq and swearing in well over, uh, I think it was 180 uh, un undocumented people who were joined the United States military. They had won bronze stars, silver stars. They had, been, they had, they, they had purple hearts. They, I mean, and, you know, these are people who have demonstrated they're prepared. They're, in a sense, many of them more Americans than a lot of Americans. We're going to address the structural racism in our country as well. You know, and it's going to take not just uh, criminal justice reform, but it's also going to require the inequities that have led to this god-awful situation in which African-Americans and Latinos suffer at the hands of the, of the coronavirus to a much greater extent than others. And look, I know we share the same goals in many of these things. What, we've had different ideas how to accomplish them. But on some issues, we're going to continue to disagree respectfully, but not on any substantive way. You know, I, I, I believe there's a great opportunity, a great opportunity to work together to deploy policy approaches that can take us closer to our shared goals. So I'm pleased to announce that Bernie and I have agreed to establish, as we said, we already talked about it, six policy working groups, one on the economy, one on education, one on criminal justice, it should be reform, not punishment, one on immigration, climate change, and the economy. These groups are made up of thoughtful leaders that have worked with Bernie and some of whom have supported me as well. And the task is for them to develop creative new ideas and proposals. And we're looking forward to turning that work into positive change for the country. So Bernie, let I think it's time we let these folks get going. And I, I just want to say to you, I can't tell you how much I appreciate all that you have done, all that uh, during all this time, what people are surprised about. You and I have been friends. We've disagreed, but we've been friends. We go all the way back your first run. And, uh, and I, uh, I appreciate your friendship, and I promise you I will not let you down. But I understand you may have a closing statement to make, Bernie, or, or anything, else, anything you want to do. It doesn't have to be closing, but anything at all. Well, I thought we'd play some chess. What do you think? Uh, I'd like to play chess. I've All been right. playing on my cell phone. That's about it. <laughs> I got a beautiful chess board upstairs. I haven't got right, anybody I got, to play I got mine. I'll bring it up. I we'll, see the one we'll behind bore you. bore everybody. Yeah, you got one right here. We'll bore everybody for a few hours. Yeah. But look, Joe, in all seriousness, in, in this terrible moment in our history, and given the enormous challenges that we face in the future, it is... I mean, we don't have a choice. We're going to have to come together, bring the best minds, bring all of our people uh, together uh, to work our way out of this crisis. We are, and I've said this a million times, so let me say it a million and one, we're the richest country in the history of the world. You know that? We should not have a half a million people who are homeless. We should not have half of our workers living paycheck to paycheck. We should not have more people in jail than any other country, disproportionately African-American and Latino. You know, you made the point about undocumented workers. The ugly irony is those people today in America are putting their lives on the line. And you know what? They're not even eligible for the benefits 
that we have appropriated in the Senate. Imagine that. You know, they can't get that $1,200 check. They can't get unemployment. So we got a lot of work to do to make this country the kind of nation that I know you want to see, that I want to see, and the vast majority of the American people want to see. We got to deal with income and wealth inequality. We got to deal with a health care system that is broken in so many ways. Well, you mentioned the issue of climate change. Man, we don't have a choice there. Future of the planet determines, demands that we are bold in transforming our energy system. And as you've indicated, we can create millions of jobs doing that. So there's a lot of work to do. Let's go forward together and uh, in doing that. And I know you are the kind of guy who is going to be inclusive. You want to bring people in, even people who disagree with you. You want to hear what they have to say. We can argue it out. It's called democracy. You believe in democracy, so do I. Let's respect each other. Let's address the challenges we face right now and in the future. And in that regard, Joe, I very much look forward uh, to working with you. Well, Bernie, thank you. And look, uh, one of the things that uh, I think as a student of history, as you are American history, you know, out of every crisis America has faced from the Civil War straight through to today, um, we have come out of it stronger. We've come out of it and fixed things that were institutionally, structurally wrong beforehand. We haven't fixed them all. But look what happened with the Great Depression. We got everything from Social Security to right, a whole range of things. Well, this is a time. And I think what's happened is the American public have seen, as I said earlier, I've said it maybe a million times, I'm going to say a million and one, we've kind of ripped the Band-Aid off, we've exposed how so the substructure of this economy is so, so damaged by what's going on. And the idea we're still arguing about whether health care is a right is bizarre. The idea that we continue to think that the way to deal with the criminal justice system now that we've known so much and learned so much is to punish instead of rehabilitate. The idea we keep someone in, we put someone in jail for a drug abuse and we don't put them in a rehabilitation, mandatory rehabilitation as opposed to prison. The idea we have people in prison who can't read and don't have any skill, that we don't train them so when they get out, you don't give them a bus ticket and 25 bucks and put them underneath a bridge. But I'd like to close by saying, Bernie, uh, as Jill and I told you and Jane, we're deeply grateful to both of you. We have, uh, you, you, you've put the interest of this nation and the need to beat Donald Trump above all else. And for that, Jill and I are grateful. And we know we have enormous responsibility to meet that expectation. We also want you to know I'm excited to, to do the work with you in the months and years ahead. You know, as you say, not me, us. Not me, us. That's your phrase, pal. And your supporters and I are going to make the same commitment. I see you. I sell your supporters. I see you. I hear you. I understand the urgency of what it is that we have to get done in this country. And I hope you'll join us. The more, the more, the merrier. We need to come together. We need to defeat Donald Trump. As I've said for a long time, when we, when we do that, we'll not only do the hard work of rebuilding this nation, we can transform this nation. We can transform it so that it goes down in history with your help, Bernie, as one of the most progressive administrations since Roosevelt. And I really sure. believe that's, I think it's doable because the whole world has changed. It's not just us. The whole world has changed. We're in the middle of a, a fourth industrial revolution. The question is, will there be a middle class left based on all that's happening? We have to address it. It's not just our concern. If we, the wealthiest country in the world, can't address it and provide more equity and opportunity, we're going to continue to see the kind of shifts you see in Europe. So anyway, I'm looking forward to working with you, pal. I really genuinely mean it from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for being such a gentleman. Thank you for being so generous. And I give you my word, I'll try my best not to let you all down. Okay. Thank you very much, Jill. Thanks, pal. Say hello to Jane I and I say hello to Jill as well. I will.